All right. Well, for those of you who don't know, To the Kingdom is a reference to the It Is Finished musical that we had just had last weekend. So if you're like, where did that come from? But it's so good to be with you on Easter. I don't know if I've heard it yet, but as tradition is, I got it. Here's the Easter message. Are you ready? He is risen. That sounded like really, really kind of low key. A dude rose from the dead, all right? The tomb was empty, so he has risen. He is risen There we go, there we go. All right, well, I want to encourage you, if you can find one of these black Bibles around you in the chairs, uh, if you struggle to find it, we're going to be in the New Living Translation. You can uh, pull out a YouVersion Bible app or whatever you might want to use on your phone. And if you don't have a Bible, Even if there's one maybe not right next to you, uh, please come see me. We want to make sure we get one of these in your hands. If you know someone who could use a Bible, we'd love to to give these away. So take this. It's yours. It's yours to give. It's yours to take. However uh, you see fit. And we're going to be in Mark chapter 8, verse 27 to 30. And as we go through this, you might be wondering, why the heck are we in a random chapter in Mark? Why aren't we at the end of Mark where we see the resurrection of Jesus? What are we doing? Well, simply as a church, we've been journeying through the gospel account of Mark. And to really kind of go high level, we actually looked at how this gospel account wasn't actually probably the account of Mark, but was the account of Jesus' follower, Peter. And that Peter had probably used Mark to help pen it, and then we gave the name of the gospel of Mark. And so we are looking at one of Jesus' closest disciples' accounts of Jesus' life, his ministry, ultimately his death and his resurrection. And as I was praying through what do we do for this Easter message, I, I kind of just had God just hit me with, every time you give an Easter message, you try too hard. And I was like, all right. And it was like, the, the Easter message is simple. I died for you, and unlike anyone else throughout history, I rose from the grave, and I forgave your sins. And that's the Easter message. But that message is throughout all of Scripture. We find God's grace and His mercy and His love and His forgiveness in the Old Testament. We find it here in the middle of the Gospel of Mark. And so rather than some specific message just geared towards that, uh, we're going to be just kind of where we're at as a church. And so if you were with us last week, we were just before this. If you're going to be with us next week, guess what? We're going to just keep continuing with where we're at. So we're in Mark uh, chapter 8. And as I was reflecting on the whole idea of this and of Easter, I remember the importance of just finding church on Easter. Maybe some of you are traveling or you're tuning in online because you're uh, trying to make sure you can gather for, for Easter gathering in some capacity. I remember as a family, uh, I was really blessed with the opportunity. My, my parents made the goal to go see every Major League Baseball stadium. And so we would travel a lot to go see all these different games. And I'll never forget being in Seattle, Washington, of all places, to see the Seattle Mariners. And it was like we had to find a church to go to. And we just walked into this random church. And I'll never forget seeing the priority of that happening. I never quite could understand the faith of Jesus at that point. But I saw there was an importance to worshiping and to being with the church family. But for Christians coming to faith, it actually isn't just about going to church. It isn't just about checking in. It isn't just showing up for Easter. It's about celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's about believing in that resurrection. And then it's about living out what it would be like to be a follower of the resurrected Savior. That's really what it all comes down to. And for Jesus' followers, they didn't know all of that was going to happen. But Jesus was paving the way for them. He was helping them to understand. He was helping them to show what would happen. And so we begin this conversation that he has with his disciples. And I'm going to read the the passage for us, and then we're going to break it down a little bit. So we're going to be in Mark chapter 8, starting in verse 27. It says, Jesus and his disciples left Galilee and went up to the villages near Caesarea Philippi. As they were walking along, he asked them, who do people say I am? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say you are one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, 
But who do you say I am? Peter replied, you are the Messiah. But Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. We'll actually see next week that this conversation continues. This is part A of the conversation. Part B is Jesus foretelling of what was going to happen to him. And while we're just covering this one part, I pray that you can continue on through the next part as well. But this first part is so important for us to focus on three specific questions that were being asked by the text. See, questions of faith, they they come up all the time. I don't know what brought you to this moment, but at some point in your life, you are going to question the very faith that you believe. Sure, you may think about faith today because it's Easter Sunday, but what about the other 364 days in the year? Jesus and his disciples, if we look at the text, we can see that this was just an ordinary day for them. Jesus said to his disciples, it's verse 27, they left Galilee and they went up to the villages near Caesarea Philippi. And then look at these words, as they were walking along. It's just like as if they were just going along the road, as if they were walking along, then he pops this question on them. Now, to give us a better understanding, it, it, the actual translation of what would it be, and in the road. So not like physically in the road, but you would translate it, and in the road. As if, like, as they're just on the road, as they're just in this road, as they're in this journey from Galilee to Caesarea Philippi, as they're going here, all of a sudden Jesus asks them a question, who do these people think or say that I am? I want you to imagine this scene with me for a moment. Jesus and his disciples are just walking along from one city to the next. Now, they didn't have some cargo van. They didn't have some church bus. They didn't have any of that to go from place to place. They had their sandals, their walking sticks, and one another. So as they're walking up the road, guess what's happening as they walk this way? People are walking what? the other way. And as they're walking this way, I'm sure you have some who are walking in the fast lane on the left going 70 miles an hour. And they're maybe, you know, just strolling on the right. Or who knows, maybe Jesus was like, no, we're going 85. I don't care. (laughs) No matter what it is, you have people coming and going. And, And what had just happened is Jesus had just healed the blind man, right, in the previous passage, in Bethsaida. And so imagine as, as this is happening, people are probably talking because people don't just heal blind men, okay? This doesn't just happen. And so there's a commotion and there's an energy and there's something happening and Jesus and his disciples are going from one town to the next. And where are they going? They're going to a town that only appears in the Bible twice. It's the town of Caesarea Philippi. Why is this town important? Not because it's only mentioned twice in the New Testament. Not because it's most likely the most northern region that Jesus and his disciples went during his ministry. In fact, to give us a picture, it's 120 miles north of Jerusalem. I mean, imagine how fit these guys had to be. (laughs) That's what I think of. Like, you know, they're walking around everywhere. But it's 20 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. And if we've been following this passage, we see that most of this ministry has been happening around the Sea of Galilee. But here's what's important about Caesarea Philippi. It seems to have been a religious center from the earliest of days. The Canaanites, they had believed or worshipped the god Baal Gad, which is the god of fortune. So the Canaanites worshipped this false god who they thought would give them fortune. We see this in the Old Testament. Later in the Greek period of history, there was a shrine in the cave that was dedicated to the god Pan. Now, this cave immediately north of Caesarea Philippi was said to be the birthplace of Pan. If you study the Greek gods, you see that they have all these crazy birthplaces around the world, and this happens to be the god of Pan's birthplace. This is the God of nature, fields, forests, mountains, flocks, and shepherds. What gods are being worshipped here? 
The gods who take care in their mind of the things of this world, from the earth itself to the flocks to shepherding, and also the God who gives good fortune. And here goes Jesus into this town. The Canaanites, they worshiped the God of good fortune in this city. The Greeks, they worshiped the God of shepherds in this very same place. Now Jesus is like, hey, let's go to this town. And throughout Jesus' ministry, we see that over and over again, he addresses both of these topics because what is Jesus showing? That he's not just some man, but he's who? God himself, God's anointed, the chosen one, the Christ. He's trying to drive this point home. He's not just doing miracles to be like, hey, look, I have this magic trick that I can do. He's doing them because he's showing he is the one true God. And so now he goes to this place where they're worshiping other gods, and he has throughout his ministry shown that he's greater than these gods. Because what are they worshiping? Well, they're worshiping the gods who would give them provision. Well, Jesus gave provision. It was in Matthew chapter 6. If you ever want to pick out a part of Scripture to read, read Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And I guarantee you will read it and you'll be like, all right, I can get behind that guy. It's the Sermon on the Mount. It's the longest monologue of Jesus recorded in the Scriptures. And it's in Matthew 6 that he says, don't, don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. They go to worship the God of fortune, right, in this city, and Jesus is saying, look, God gives you everything you need. He provides everything. Your fortune is in the kingdom of God, and his provision comes with it. Jesus, throughout his ministry, also promised guidance. They worshiped the God that would worship the shepherds or the land and, and give them sh uh, guidance. And what did Jesus say in John chapter 10, 11? He says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for his sheep. Jesus, throughout ministry, addressed head on these false gods. And as they're walking to the city, guess what's probably happening? People are coming back who are worshiping these false gods. People are going to Caesarea Philippi to worship these false gods. And Jesus is taking his disciples and us, as we go through this text, on a journey. For my commute home, I always joke that I probably live one of the furthest from the church, and it's because when God called us here, we had a newborn baby, and there was no desire to move, and then the housing market just exploded, and so then we're like, thank you, Lord, that we got the house when we did, but please keep gas prices low. <laughs> so I have to go up 94 to Chesterfield. I like to call it Chester Tucky. <laughs> and uh, I ride this all the time, and as I was driving this week, I was really kind of just meditating on this, this passage, right? And, and I was thinking about Jesus and his disciples being on the road. Now I'm in a car alone, so it's not the same. But, you know, I'm talking to the Lord. I'm like, okay, what's going on? And I pull off the exit ramp, and here's the bumper sticker right in front of me. Hail Satan. Now, <laughs> picture this with me. As we're coming and going in life, people have all different perspectives of what they worship, do they not? As we're going up and down this road, you have me who is blaring my worship music, having this moment with God, and then he's like, but look at what's in front of you, buddy. Because they have something that they're wrestling with. And you know what? I could kind of say, well, what are they thinking, those naive people? Or I could say, look, this is why Jesus' love is so important to this world. Because there are people that are going up and down I-94 who are worshiping different gods. Who are worshiping gods that are going to lead to misery, depression, anxiety. Worshiping gods that aren't going to fill them with love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. 
The Canaanites, they had their gods they worshipped. The Greeks, they had their gods they worshipped. And in our world today, people have the gods they worship. Oftentimes, it's not the bumper sticker, Hail Satan, which to me kind of says someone was hurt by the church. But it's the gods of money, the gods of fame and popularity, the god of sports, the god of their children in their activities. I don't know what it is, but there are gods that as we come and go throughout life, they take the precedent in our life. They are the gods that we are worshiping. And in some capacity, we are all going up and down that freeway called life. And we are always having these gods that we're asking, who's the priority? We may see cars when we come and go on our freeways. But Jesus and his disciples, they saw faces. They saw people. They were walking. They weren't behind a tinted window or a windshield. And it's in this coming and going that it says, as they were walking along, Jesus asked them, who do people say I am? That is a big question for us to wrestle with. Who do people around you, who do those coming and going say I am? Our first question is, who do others say God is? Well, the response was, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and well, others say you are one of the other prophets. Why is this important for us? We might just look at these names and say, well, I don't understand it, but let's break it down for a little bit. First off, some say John the Baptist. It was in Mark chapter 6 that we see Herod have the same exact encounter about what people say this Jesus is. And Herod is is pretty nervous. It's in Mark chapter 6 verse 14 where he thought that Jesus was actually John the Baptist returned from the grave. Do you remember this? And why did Herod have this paranoia that Jesus had been, was John the Baptist reincarnated, it was because he had killed John the Baptist, not because he wanted to, but because of a bet he made and a deal he made, and so he then had to fulfill his bet. And he had this guilty conscience, I bet, about what happened. See, John the Baptist was the greatest man to ever live. That's what Jesus told us. And Herod executed him, not because he wanted to, but because of the deal he made. It says in Mark 6, 14, Herod the king soon heard about Jesus because everyone was talking about him. Some were saying this must be John the Baptist raised from the dead. That's why he can do such miracles. Do you notice that people are talking about who? Jesus. So much so that the king actually is hearing about it himself. And then what does he say? They say, well, others, they said he's the prophet Elijah. Still others said he's a prophet like other great prophets in the past. Well, is he John the Baptist? Is he Elijah? Well, Elijah from 2 Kings 2.11, this is where we see that Elijah didn't die. In fact, he was taken up to heaven alive. And as a result of this, Malachi's prophecy, many Jews believed that someday Elijah was going to return. And so now they're wondering, is this Elijah coming back? In 2 Kings 2.11, it says, As they were walking along and talking, suddenly a chariot of fire appeared, drawn by a horses of fire, and it drove between two men separating them, and who Elijah was carried by a whirlwind into heaven. And so they were like, when is Elijah coming back? This Jesus, he must be Elijah returning. Or... The other one is, was he one of the prophets? He's just another prophet, right? Islam makes this claim. Many people would be okay with this claim that Jesus is just one of the prophets. He's just a holy book person. He's just someone that people worship and they they look to, but really he's just one of many ways that lead to God. Maybe that's who this Jesus is. 
is. Do you not see our world in each of these answers? If John the Baptist was the best man to ever live, that's how I hear Jesus described all the time. Well, Jesus was a good man. Jesus did good things. Jesus had a lot of love and he had a big heart. He was like the best person ever. But he's not God. He's not John the Baptist. But many of us, as we come and go on that road, we say that he is. Well, he's just like Elijah, one of God's most favored prophets. So much so that he was so favored that he never really had to die. This is where we kind of get stuck in this, well, kind of he's like, you know, he's not even just a good guy. He's better than a good guy, but still not quite to God capacity. He's like the best prophet to ever live. And then even religions of the world, major religions of this world, they don't know what to do with this Jesus, so they just say he's a really, really good prophet. Is he just like that? Is he just like Elijah? Well, many people say he is. Or is he like the other prophets? Maybe just one of those other prophets. Let's just put Jesus in the same camp as other religious leaders and people who have been close to God. But that doesn't describe Jesus. Yet most of our world and many likely even here today, would probably shake their head in agreement at some of these statements. C.S. Lewis famously said, in a civilization like ours, I feel that everyone has to come to terms with the claims of Jesus Christ upon his life, or else be guilty of inattention or of evading the question. Where our world stands with Jesus, I think, is like, this story. There was a woman who went into a jewelry store. And I don't know, my kids are so into jewelry. It's crazy. They like, look at my drip, Dad. Okay. <laughs> so this woman goes into the jewelry store to get some fresh drip. <laughs> and as she goes in, she wants this necklace with a cross on it. And the guy looks and he says, well, I have several options for you. I have this plain cross or I have this cross with a, with a little man on it. Which one would you like? Bear with me. I have this plain cross. I see it's a cross. Or I have this cross with a little man on it. I don't know why this little man is on this cross, but there's a little man on this cross. Church, I believe we're in that world where many of us, if we were to ask what's the difference between the two crosses, it'd be a cross and a little man on that cross. But I don't know why. I don't think this illustration is far off because how many do not know of the saving love of Jesus and what he's done for them? They don't even know about the cross, let alone the man who is on it. Now, I love personally the empty cross better because he didn't stay on the cross. I do have a cross that I wear seldomly, and it has the little man on it, Jesus, and that was because it was my dad's cross, and I didn't choose that. He did. He just liked the man on it. That's what he told me. But I like the empty one because that's what we have for Easter. But it's not about that. It's about do we even know the difference between the two. So that's question one. Who do the people, as they're coming and going, say God is? You can sit here, and you can be kind of okay with that. But then there's a second question, and this one gets a little more personal. It's who do you say God is? It's not about who they, coming and going, say he is. It's about who do you say he is? They replied, son, John the Baptist, some Elijah, others say you are one of the prophets. But verse 29, then he asked them, but who do you say I am? Do you see how personal it gets? All of a sudden, it's not about the world around them. It's not about the people coming and going. It's really not about the faces that they see. It becomes personal to the disciples. Who do you specifically say I am? 
whew, that's where if I'm in that situation, I take a giant gulp. I don't know what to say, Jesus. Think about it, like in that moment, in that time, what are they going to say? I've heard people tell me everything. From God is the energy around me, to God is nothing. Every single person has a thought and a place that they stand in answering this question. And as you sit here and ponder that question today, you have an answer to that question. Even if your answer is, I don't know, that is your answer of, I don't know. Agnosticism is a growing faith in our country for a reason because we don't like making decisions. And when we have to make a decision of who God is, it becomes uncomfortable because all of a sudden it's become divisive. You can't have multiple ways. You can only have one. And so the issue becomes, when it becomes personal, now we don't really want to talk about Jesus in the same way. But he asks them, who do you say I am? am. And suddenly the focus moves off of the crowd and it begins to work on just the disciples who are with him. And let me ask you this Easter, who is Jesus to you? We live in a world of podcasters and influencers with echo chambers of religious and political thought surrounding us and inundating us. But one of the most important things that we can actually do is get real with where we stand when it comes to Jesus. Are we here because it's just tradition and it's Easter and I should be? Am I here because I'm here for family and supporting him? Am I here just to please others so that dinner will go okay today? <laughs> or am I here because of what Peter says? Am I here because of the conclusion that he makes? He asked them, who do you say I am? And Peter replied, you are the Messiah. For the first time in Mark's gospel, since Mark 1.1, 1, 1, for the first time in Mark's gospel, the actual disciples say, you are the Christ. Now this is important for us because Christ is not Jesus' last name. We always call him Jesus Christ as if, like, his name is Robert Went. No, it's not Jesus with last name Christ, okay? He's Jesus, the son of Mary and Joseph, right? Well, actually God and Mary, but that, we'll say that. <laughs> He's not Jesus Christ. He's Jesus the Christ. You can't forget the in the middle between Jesus and Christ. But we do it all the time. Because it's here that he is saying, look, no, you, Jesus, you're the anointed one. You're the Messiah. You're God's chosen one. You're the one who's going to save us. You're the one that we've been waiting for. This is a huge statement. It's the pinnacle of Mark's gospel, believe it or not. Because in Mark 1.1, 1, 1, like any good author, you lay out what you're writing about. And Mark 1.1 1, 1 says, this is the good news about Jesus the Messiah. The only other, like up to this point, that is the only time we see him called this. Not only the Messiah, but who? The Son of God. This is what this whole account is about. This is what Mark is about. It's about Jesus the Christ. And finally, finally the disciples say it with their own mouth, Jesus, you are the Messiah. We've seen you walk on water. We've seen you calm the storm. We've seen you heal the blind man. We've seen you heal the paralytic. We've seen you do the miraculous with healing the woman who was bleeding for 12 years. We've seen you do all of these things. But finally we get it. You're not just the one who can take a few loaves and some fish and feed thousands, but you are actually God himself. You are here with us. Simon Peter's response is so important. In Matthew, we see the same story, but Matthew expounds on it more than Mark does. In Matthew 16, 16, it says, Simon Peter answered him, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And then what's important, and if you just want to hear these words, is Jesus' response to him. Now, this is in Matthew 
Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven, and whatever you permit on earth we will be permitted in heaven. In this passage in Mark, when we take it and we actually see the parallel passage in Matthew, we see how big of a conversation was happening. Because it is in this profession of Peter that then Jesus says, look, God Almighty has revealed this to you, and guess what, Peter? I'm building my church on you. And the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Back to Caesarea Philippi, the cave the gods that they worship, the birthplaces of those gods. And what is Jesus really saying? None of that compares to my kingdom. None of that compares to me. He is making a big, audacious claim that the kingdom of God has arrived on earth and nothing is going to stop it. The key to building Jesus' church on earth started with first recognizing who Jesus was. He was the Christ. This took place where many gods had been worshipped, and now Jesus is revealing that he is the true Son of God. In the next couple weeks, we're going to see this transpire because Jesus is about to do something incredible as he has the transfiguration. He's only going to show them more and more of who he is, but they first had to come to the place of saying, you are the true God, the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed, chosen one. And so he replied, you are blessed because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. Understanding Jesus is not a physical experience as much as it is a spiritual one. Scripture is very clear that it is God himself who reveals himself to us. We live in a world where there's a lot of gods that we worship because we can see and touch them. We can count our fame and fortune and our followers. We can look at our prestige and our status. We have the gods of sexuality and sex, the gods of political parties and affiliations, the gods of social media, technology, sports, and the many ways that we spend our time. Yet Jesus is asking, where am I in the midst of all these gods? Better yet, he's asking, who am I? The third question we must ask out of this is what are we going to do? We know who people say God is. You, yourself, know who you say God is. But the real question you got to ask is, what does it mean for Jesus to be Christ of my life? Oswald Chambers says, Jesus Christ never asked anyone to define his position or understand a creed, but this, who am I to you? Jesus Christ makes the whole of human destiny depend on a man's relationship to himself. All Jesus wants is a relationship with you. That's how you see who he is. I pray that this Easter is an opportunity for you to get real about who Jesus is in your life and to really sit and mellow in that. And in a world full of distractions and temptations, I pray that you have a moment where you can say, but God, who are you to me? Jesus, who are you to me? Jesus, if you are truly the Christ, I want to embrace that, believe in that. And when you put your faith in that and you actually proclaim it, guess what's going to happen? You're going to see the kingdom of God in a whole new way. You're going to see the world in a whole new way. You're going to see the Bible in a whole new way. You're going to see church in a whole new way. You're going to see your life in a whole new way. Anxiety, depression, despair, all those things that we face as human beings, you're going to approach them in a whole new way. 
because you see what the Christ does for you. My favorite passage is found in Ephesians chapter 2. It's Ephesians 2, verses 4 to 8. And it says this, But God is so rich in mercy, and he loved us so much, that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved, for he was raised from the dead along with Christ and seated us at him in the heavenly realms because we are united to Christ Jesus. Are you catching it? We are God's favored people. We get seated in the heavenly realms with him. Why? Because of what he did for us. So God, it says, can point to all of us in future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us, as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God saved you by his grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. This is a gift from God. There is nothing you can do to earn your way to heaven. Every religion of the world teaches that merit-based salvation. Do this, do that, you get to heaven. Christ never taught that. He said, believe in me. Understand and, and profess me as savior of your life. And then out of that, guess what? You're gonna have me filled with love and mercy, and grace, and gentleness, and goodness, and self-control. Those are the fruits of the Spirit that you're going to have pouring out of your life because He is filling up your life. But if He's not filling up your life, you're constantly going to be trying to figure out the answers on your own, and you're going to be lost. But there's nothing you've done to deserve it. It's because he went to a cross for you and he empty, an empty tomb for you because he rose from the grave so that we could be drawn to him. And so the question I have for us, church, is how do we thank him for that? How do we thank him for coming to the earth? As John says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. How do we thank him for sacrificing himself, the one perfect spotless lamb, the new covenant of his blood that he made with us to make us right with God? How do we thank him for that? How do we thank him for the tomb that was empty, That doesn't just happen. How do we thank him for the way that the world has changed because of him? If you take a simple overview of history, it is undoubtable that something miraculous happened in the A.D. 33 because everything got reset around it. The whole world changed because of it. And now, 2,000 years later, Billions of people are worshiping the God who rose from that empty tomb. The question is, do you believe it? Do you let that actually resonate in your life? And then once you believe it, how do you thank him for all he's done? Trust me, church, I don't deserve to be up here. I've done nothing to deserve the goodness and love and mercy of God. But he richly gives it to all who call on his name. And he says, I don't care who you were before me. I care about who you are after me. And he changes each and every one of our birth dates so that we aren't who we were before Christ, but we are who we are, Hedio Domine, after Christ. And I pray this Easter encourages you to really ask, who is Christ to me? And that you come to the place, he is the risen one, the anointed one, the savior of the world. Will you pray with me?